Hey T Heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, I'm gonna be deep diving into a subject which I find absolutely fascinating, and that is cultivars. What are cultivars and how important are they in determining the experience that you can expect in your tea? In order to do this, I've got two rogue oolongs here. These are new in, this is Swallow's Nest, and this is Orchard Stream. Two new rogueways. I've actually tasted this tea before. If you saw a video that I did about bowl brewing in Hastings when I was on holiday, I'll put a link in the description below. I was tasting lots of rogueways and we selected this rogueway because I absolutely loved it, but I felt it needed an extra roast. So we roasted it one more time and now it has rested and arrived. So we've got two rogueways. So the same cultivar here from the same part of China. Let's quickly scope these teas. This uh, Swallow's Nest was picked in October 2021. This Orchard Stream was picked in July 2021. So earlier and this is a bit later. This one was roasted an extra time though as I said. The uh, cultivar are both rogueways. So that's all you would see on the packaging, both saying rogueway. The origin, Swallow's Nest, comes from Swallow's Nest in Wuyi in Fujian in China, and the uh, Orchard Stream comes from Bai Yunyan in Wuyi, Fujian, China. So same part of the world. Of course, there's gonna be intricate differences in the terroir depending on the field, but they are from the same mountainous area of China. The picking is the same up to the third leaf. The elevation is around the same. This one's about 630, this is about 800, so relatively similar. So we've got similar area, we've got similar elevation, we've got the same cultivar, we've got slight difference in terms of picking, but they're both the same year, a few months apart. So let's taste these teas, and then we're gonna dive deeper into the subject of cultivars and apologies for all of the clumsiness. I have injured my shoulder here so I cannot use that arm. So I'm gonna be um, trying to do everything, including editing this video with one arm, which ain't gonna be easy, but we will give it a go. It's good practice for me to Try to stay balanced. I've got two 100 mil guy ones here, one true T guy one, and a new one, T heads. This is our newest uh, in our limited edition range of 100 mil white guy ones with the two little goldfish there swimming in the tea. Okay, so let's put these leaves in. You can see that they look relatively similar. Swallow's nest looks a bit darker slightly darker. I think actually they've had the same number of roasts. When I tasted the uh, Orchard Stream uh, a few, oh, the smells. Um, when I tasted the Orchard Stream a few months ago, I just felt that it was very bright and needed an extra roast just to settle it. Okay, so two rogueways. How different are they gonna be? Oh, this is just classic. It has some fruit. Of course it has some fruit, but it has a predominance of those yencha notes that we all know and love. You know, um, it's warming. It's not got much of a, a, a charcoal-y roasted note because we always allow at least a few months for the charcoal, the, the, the baked aroma to dissipate. And then you're left with chocolates, you're left with almonds, you're left with... Um, fudge you're left with um, a slight uh, antique wood, varnished antique wood. And as I said, there is fruit there as well, but the fruit tastes or smells baked, like baked oranges. Uh, so yes, yeah, sliced, thinly sliced oranges baked in the oven. There's also um, a distinctive little cannabis twang to the aromatics as well, like a spicy, um, a spicy variety. Okay, now let's smell this rogue way. Incredible peach notes, totally different. It it reminds me of hard peach candies, just like boiled sweets, but but intensely peachy. I'm also getting some grapefruit as well in the nose. So it is just a completely different 
aromatics. Completely different. Okay, there are some similarities. I'm at, I am picking up some chocolate. I am picking up some nuts, but it's more hazelnuts. So chocolate, hazelnut, Nutella style notes in the background. But if you buy this tea, and it is a very special grade tea, so you know, um, be prepared for the price. But if you buy this tea, you are gonna be met with a nose full of the most intense, fruity, bright, peachy, uh, peachy apricot grapefruit aromatics that well, I've ever experienced in a Yencha. So, just on the dry smell, very, very different. And we're gonna be trying to sort of dissect and talk about what possibly could make, make those differences for everyone of you squirming because the rinse is too long. I've only got one arm and it's not my best arm. This shoulder is giving me grief. You may have seen a previous video that I did where the same thing happened. Basically, if I make the wrong move with this shoulder, then I get like an inflammation that gets like the bursitis and it's really painful. In fact, if you watch, if you want, you can go back and watch a video in Japan. I think it's the video how green tea is made and you'll see that I'm very stiff in that one because the same thing happened there. Um, I know a lot of people like to keep the first infusion in order for them to um, drink it at the end. I'm not gonna do that now. Cat is gonna get a luxury tasting of a special grade uh, Rogue in that uh, orchard stream and this really, really delicious, more classic Rogue Way, I would say. Um, in Swallow's Nest. Okay, let's have a smell of Swallow's Nest wet. Oh, same theme. Um, the fruit has now become raisins, but the raisins are um, soaked in. It's got a little peated whiskey note. Not too peaty, but it's definitely got a peated whiskey note. So peated whiskey soaked raisins uh, cranberries, so some of those red fruits. Um, um, and yeah, so those antique woods as well. You can see the look of those leaves. The dark chocolate also persists. Makes my mouth water. I'm not picking up a cinnamon note, and rogue means cassia, which has that cinnamon flavor to it, cassia bark. Um, and so if you are looking for a rogue and you're thinking that rogue always need to have that cinnamon note, then, well, just don't think that because that's not the case. Um, and I've done a vid, we did a, a video before uh, with Cherry Storm, which was another rogue and that one as well had very little cinnamon, maybe in the aftertaste, but very little cinnamon. And so again, just, you know, this is gonna be the theme running through this video, that the sort of archetypes of a cultivar, they're very ephemeral. And, and, and to, to be honest with you, if you're looking for specific sort of flavor note anchors to anchor you to a, a particular cultivar, I think you're gonna be disappointed. And I think you should celebrate the fact that every cultivar, that even within a cultivar, there's so much variation. Okay, here we go. Orchard Stream, incredible. Reminds me a little bit of a cross between a, a Chilan Summer Haze and a Dan Song. Um, tea. So uh, for those of you who know Dan Song, you know that means we are talking bags and bags full of aroma. We're talking about um, the, the, the peaches are just now they've gone out of the candy territory and they are fresh, fresh, more, more fresh nectarines, fresh like yellow flesh nectarines. Um, so bright, fruity, but a little bit punchy as well. And there's flowers as well. I'm getting... Um, lotus flowers, I'm getting, yeah, l lotus flowers and nectarines. And then again, that chocolate note is still there. Just in the background, there is a slight chocolate note and uh, an, an almond note, maybe almond brittle. Yeah, if you've ever had a dime bar, that central part of a dime bar, the almond brittle. So extremely different. You can see the look of the leaves are different as well. Um, darker, lighter. So there's gonna be some processing differences in there. I'm gonna crank the temperature up with my left hand. 
move these out of the way. If you see me wince, don't worry, it'll be better soon. Um, let's talk about Rogueway. Rogueway is a very classic uh, cultivar growing in Fujian province. Uh, mostly used to make yencha, these style of rock oolong yencha, means rock tea, and uh, it's a, you know, a roasted strip oolong, very, very aromatic. And the Rogue Way cultivar is always talked about as being one of the most aromatic. Um, also, people talk about it as being quite accessible. In other words, it may not have the same price tag as some of those very famous Shri Jin Gui, Tie Lo Han, uh, teas, however, in my experience, you can get, uh, with Rogue just like Shui Shen, you can get a very, very big uh, difference in price from very, very, very affordable, cheap to affordable, to mid-price, to all the way up to very, very, very expensive uh, teas. As I said, these are both very high quality Rogue Ways, and we've only got a small amount of Orchard Stream because it is extremely high ticket tea. Okay. Rogue has been around as a cultivar for a couple of a hundred years, so it's a well-established cultivar in Fujian. And that length of time, as you'll see, is probably one of the main reasons why there is such a difference in the experience, the taste, the aromatics that you get from Rogue because when you have a lot of time, there's a lot of potential changes that can happen. And we're gonna be talking about those changes after we do this initial tasting. Really not used to using my left hand. So this is good practice for me. Right, color difference. Orchard Stream looks a bit lighter to my eyes. Both lovely sort of ambers and golds, rums and whiskies. Yeah. Yeah, that looks a bit darker to me. And the leaf is definitely noticeably darker. Okay, so let's bring these cups in. And let's give them a taste. Let's focus on texture first. Cheers, everybody. Swallow's Nest. A great field in Wuyi and so satisfying. <coughs> it's, it's thick. It's actually quite soft, a little bit syrupy, but then does give you a nice little quench at the end as you would want from a rock tea. Oh, delicious. Taste-wise, we are talking a little bit of um, burnt sugar, like creme brulee topping. Uh, we've got that whiskey coming through as well. Mm. Um, a little bit of fudge, we talked about that as well. Um, I am picking up a slight, just in the aftertaste, cinnamon sweet and sort of cooling spiciness. So I am getting that cassia note, but it is very subtle. Um, and um, I would say that spice is actually quite um, verdant as well. I'm picking up uh, like that cannabis twang is turned into like a thyme or oregano, more like thyme, like mountain herb note. I'm getting sweetness, but that sweetness is more, um, not so much bright fruitiness, more like dried fruitiness, like, uh, talked about cranberries before, but maybe more like red date, uh, dadzao, dried, um, like a lotus seed starchy sweetness to it as well. Okay, now let's taste this orchard stream. Mm. It's a combination of this, um, these fruits with a, um, a I, it's not creaminess, but, and I've, I've given this tasting note before, but mastic, so mastic ice cream, or yeah, I think it's called mastic ice cream. Um, 
it just has a sort of, it's creamy, but also has a piney note. And I am also picking up oregano in this one here as well. But the fruits are just amazing. They've actually gone more tropical. I'm picking up mangosteen. Yeah, really sweet, really aromatic. Oh, I forgot to talk about the texture. Uh, it is thick, but it's not quite as thick as this one. And it's definitely more mineral. I'm picking up more bite to it um, than with the Swallow's Nest. And we'll, that will probably shift as we go through the infusions. But yeah, it's, it's definitely got more quench, more bite, more physical nature. Mm. So that mastic, um, the mangosteen, a bit of um, the peach is still there, but it's also got a zing, like a peach sherbet note to it. So peach and sherbet or peach sherbet, um, oregano, or oregano, if you're in the States. Uh, yeah, and just bags and bags of fruit. So very, very, very different. Uh, we'll quickly smell these empty gondabes. Normally I would wait a little bit longer. In fact, yeah, let's take this kettle off first of all. So the swallow's nest, Oh, again, the theme continues. Chocolatey, it's a very chocolatey tea. I don't remember that from the, from the uh, tasting of the, when I was sampling, but it's very, very chocolatey. It's whiskey and chocolate and some red fruits as well. Again, like um, those Dadzao dates. Yeah, dates, red, red dates, chocolate and, uh, and some whiskey. Uh, completely different, just completely different. That mastic is there, but it's, it's moved more into like a fruit yogurt, like a peach yogurt or an apricot yogurt. It reminds me of um, um, those children's yogurts, Petit Filou apricot. Um, those little pots, you probably know what I mean. Yeah, it's that. Apricot Petit Filou yogurt, and then whiskey, and the chocolate on this has got a little bit of a burnt note, or well, not burnt, but like just cooked. It reminds me of um, the smell of chocolate fondant cake. You know, those, those cakes that have the lava inside, but the outside area, the, the, the baked part of it, dark chocolate, baked. It's still got fruit, as I said, in it. So both rogueways, both very, very different. So what is happening here? Well, let me brew up again, and then we're going to dive a bit deeper into cultivars. So what is a cultivar? Cultivar basically comes from cultivated varieties. So if a farmer, producer, um, tastes a variety and says, oh, I like that variety a lot, and starts to cultivate that variety, then it becomes a cultivar. So, you know, there's going to be lots of varieties or, or you know, um, lots of different genetics out there. And we're going to be sort of diving into the genetics now um, of plants, um, but some of them won't be selected and they won't be cultivated and they won't become a cultivar. So traditionally, the, the idea is that you find a variety that you like and then you uh, have asexual propagation, which means you take a cutting of that plant and you then propagate it so that it should be genetically identical to the mother plant. And then you can continue to do that and you're basically creating uh, genetic clones of the uh, mother plant, the one that you really, really liked. Um, the other way, of course, is, asex uh, is sexual propagation, where you allow the plant to actually become pollinated and create uh, seeds, and therefore you're gonna get variations in the genetics. So the first thing that we need to talk about is genetics. That's the, the internal, let's say, that's the, the code, the makeup of that cultivar. What are the genetics of that cultivar? So that's one area that we need to discuss. And, um, and as you'll see, that's actually relatively complicated, not as simple as you may think. 
chocolate, nuts, fudge, and red fruit. The other side, so if you think about the internal, the genetic code of the plant, then you've got the external. Okay, so uh, the external can be made up of many different things. So let's, in, for the sake of this discussion, ignore what happens after picking. So obviously the taste of a tea is gonna be affected by numerous different things. Um, and after a leaf is picked, there are many different processes that the producer goes through um, and decisions that the producer makes all the way up to you know, how it's stored in your home. So there's so many different factors after picking that's gonna affect the experience in the cup. We're not gonna talk about those now. But the other external factors are factors around terroir, right? So elevation, climate, microclimate, what was it like that year um, in terms of weather, in terms of pests, insects, etc. Like, you know, what, what are the external factors which affect the plant? So you can sort of broadly create those two um, categories, internal and external. But as you'll see, there's actually a lot of merging in between. So let's start with the internal, the genetics. So we all know about DNA, right? So the DNA of a plant, the genetic code that sort of makes up all of the uh, characteristics of the plant, okay? That is supposedly fixed, but of course it is not. We know from evolution that there are always mutations happening, some of them negative, some of them favorable. In a plant, these somatic mutations so these mutations usually take place at the apical um, um, peak of the plant, so the growing part of the plant. And so you will get plants that mutate and the DNA changes. And sometimes those changes will be isolated to one part of the plant. And if the plant doesn't think that that's good, then it will actually um, kill off part of that plant. This is called uh, uh, Muller's ratchet um, is, is a, a theory around, you know, how uh, mutations can be sort of carved off. I mean, plants are amazing in that way. So there's mutations happening uh, at, at the, the growing point of the plant, but also could be um, mutations that happen, you know, in the production of seeds. So in the, so the, the misconception is therefore that if you take a plant and you take a cutting of that plant and you clone it, that it's going to be the same genetic code as the mother plant. Well, no, the mother plant may have mutations and therefore you are going to be cloning the mutation of the mother plant. And so the more times you are cloning a plant, the more likelihood you are getting away from the very original genetic material of that cultivar. So in the case of Rogue, which has 200 years of history of being, you know, grafted, cut and grafted, you're gonna have wildly different um, genetics, even within the same cultivar. So that's the first misconception. The first misconception is that asexual propagation means that you are maintaining the, ge the exact genetic code of the mother plant that's not gonna be the case. And that's one of the reasons why oftentimes you will have numbers next to uh, cultivars to see how far away from the mother, from the original tree, this graft is. Um, and uh, as I said, when you've got a tea with long history like Rogue, uh, you're gonna have a, a huge variety of different genetics. So that's the first point, the internal the genetics is actually not fixed even if you are using uh, asexual propagation cloning. Now let's talk about the external. The external is fascinating. The plant is continuously reacting to its environment. Um, so if the genetics is called phylogenetics, then the reaction during the lifetime of a plant is called ontogenetics. So you've got phylogenetics, which is the, the, the genetics of the species and how the species evolves. And then you've got ontogenetics, which is the, the shift in the way that the plant reacts over its lifetime. Now it's not changing its genetic code, apart from the mutations, but we'll, we're leaving that with phylogenetics, but it's reacting to its environment. And this is uh, you know, why every year tea tastes different, okay? It's reacting to the temperature changes, it's reacting to, to the changes in the soil, to the weather, to the insects, etc. And plant apparency theory 
means that the plant is continuously learning. So if a plant goes through some very stressful uh, situation where it's get, uh, getting an infestation of bugs and it has to defend and it creates all these defensive chemicals, it remembers that and it will then um, uh, uh, store that memory so that those uh, chemicals are ready to be released for future attacks. And in that way, you can have two rogueways, but they are going to, because of their experience out in the fields, are going to have very different um, experiences in the cup. You're going to get very different tastes, you're going to get different aromas, because all of these secondary defensive molecules are, have aromatics and flavor. And so the age of a plant, and we're talking about now like, you know, how old the actual physical plant is here, rather than how old the cultivar is in a particular area, the age of the plant is going to obviously affect the taste because the older the plant, the more experience it has had, and therefore more of these defensive molecules and chemicals are in place. So you've got differences in the cultivar, in the taste of the cultivar caused by genetic differences. You've got differences caused by the external factors, weather, etc., of any particular year, plus the fact that the plant is always learning and changing, and therefore its, its expression in the resulting tea is always going to be different. So you've got those two big factors that change the, um, the taste of the cultivar. But you've also got a joining factor, and that joining factor is epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Epigenetics is similar to the ontogenetics. In other words, it's, it's, it's about the reaction to the environment. So as the plant reacts to the environment, it's actually changing the way that the DNA is expressed, the way that the DNA is read, and it does this through very complicated things that are way above my head, but histones and methylation of DNA. But basically, it's not changing the DNA, but it's, it's sort of changing the shape or the structure or how it's packed. And so different parts of the DNA are read. And so in essence, it does sort of represent a different genetic code in a way because it's changing how, which parts of the genetic code are read. So while you have the code, you've got different ways of packaging the, the code and exposing the code that changes the way that it's read and that will also change the flavor and the experience um, in your tea. And what is absolutely fascinating is that, I believe it is proven, but it might still be a theory, that epigenetics is hereditable. In other words, if you took a cutting of a plant which we're all, going through, we're all going through epigenetic changes all the time. But if you take a cutting of a plant, that cutting will, that, the epigenetics, the way that the DNA is packaged and read, will be transferred to the clone. And even if you do asexual propagation, uh, sorry, sexual propagation, so even if you um, allowed the plant to create seeds, etc., the epigenetics supposedly are also transferred into the, the gametes, transferred into the seeds. And so you're getting the same potential code, DNA, but a shift in the way that the code is read. So you've got these three factors. You've got phylogenetics, the actual DNA itself, and that can change with uh, sexual, obviously, and asexual propagation of a cultivar. You've got ontogenetics, the learnt behavior over time of the plant, and that will mean that the same cultivar with the same genetic profile is going to taste different in different areas and depending on how old the tea trees, the, the tea plants are. And then in between you've got epigenetics, which is an expression of the DNA which is hereditable. It is passed on to future generations. So you've got these three areas, onto, uh, phylogenetics, ontogenetics, and then the join up is epigenetics. And those three factors mean that a cultivar like Rogueway, which has a long history in Fujian, is going to taste very, very different, not just dependent upon, you know, which part of 
food gen it is, but, uh, uh, but even according to the genetics and the way that the genetics are read and expressed. And that is why if you sat down with 20 different rogueways like I do every year for sure, maybe more, they're gonna taste wildly different. And so if you read somewhere uh, that rogueway needs to taste like cassia or needs to taste like cinnamon, I would take that with a big bag full of salt. And therefore the question is, well, how important is cultivar information for you as a tea buyer? If it's so varied, what difference does it make? Well, I would say that cultivar is still an important factor in, uh, in, in uh, your uh, learning of tea. There are definitely broad characteristics of a tea which you can assign to, to cultivar. But bear in mind this, that the older the cultivar, and the older the tea plant itself means that as you have more age, you're gonna have more variation. There's gonna be more variation even within the same origin, the same place. Um, and this is probably slight, I mean, it's, it's gonna be the same in wine and coffee and chocolate, but bear in mind that wine, coffee and chocolate never have plants that um, are as old as a lot of tea plants are like, I think wine sort of 40, 50 years, coffee and chocolate probably 20, 30 years. And so um, you're, you're not gonna have the same ontogenetic impact on the cultivar. So you're gonna have a, a more uniform taste, but there's still gonna be the variations that come from phylogenetics and epigenetics. I hope that that makes sense to you. Um, the takeaway point here is cultivars are interesting and important for you to learn about tea and for you to get some broad ideas about what a tea is gonna taste like, but please don't get stuck in this idea that a certain cultivar should taste a certain way, and that is borne out in this tasting here. Two rogueways tasting wildly different, but both fantastically delicious. That's it, tea heads. Check out our other videos, taste our teas wherever you are in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags, keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye. Ouch. Mistake.